This is the great feast of St. Paul with the commemoration of St. Peter. And yesterday was the great feast of St. Peter with commemoration of St. Paul. <laughs> so where you find St. Peter, you're going to find St. Paul. The two are always together because they're the, they're the two pillars of the church. St. Paul, St. Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, St. Peter, the first pope. And their skulls, their skulls are kept above the main altar on the huge golden cupola covering the main altar in St. John the Lateran Basilica in Rome. Way up on top is the golden bust of the heads of St. Peter and Paul. And inside are the, the skulls of both St. Peter and Paul. So pray for all that you know who are named after Paul, St. Paul today. Pray for all of them. And this epistle today is from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> Brethren, I give you to understand that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For neither did I receive it of man, nor did I learn it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And I made progress in the Jews' religion above many of my equals in my own nation, being more abundantly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased him who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, Immediately I condescended not to flesh and blood. Neither went I to Jerusalem to the apostles who were before me, but I went to Arabia, and again I returned to Damascus. Then after three years I went to Jerusalem to see Peter, and I tarried with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles I saw none, saving James, the brother of the Lord. Now the things which I write to you, behold, before God, I do not lie. The Gospel from St. Matthew chapter 10. <clears throat> At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and simple as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up in councils, and they will scourge you in the, their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and before kings for my sake, for a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they shall deliver you up, take no thought how or what to speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what to speak. For it is not you that speak, but the, the Spirit of your Father that speaketh in you. The brother also shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the son, and the children shall rise up against the parents, and shall put them to death. And you shall be, you shall be hated by all men for my name's sake. But he that shall persevere to the end he shall be saved. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. He that shall persevere to the end, he shall be saved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Saint Paul, such a great saint, such a powerful apostle. He's called the Athlete of Christ. And St. Paul traveled, in his day was uh, immense traveling. In our day, if he was alive now, he'd be, he'd be flying all, all over the world for sure, especially now in this, in this uh, Vatican II Part B that we're in with the, the resistance to Vatican II swallowing up the Society of St. Pius X. So, St. Paul, he, he is a model for us of these words of our Lord. Quiatim perservaviridusque ad finem 
ik savus erit. He who perseveres to the end, he shall be saved. So St. Hilary has a list of some of these, the list of the persecutions St. Paul went through. And let's compare it to what we've gone through, what little we've gone through for the sake of the Holy Catholic faith. Compare what you've gone through and I to St. Paul. Let's see if we even compare. St. Paul the Apostle, wrote St. Hilary of Poitiers, was, was first beaten with rods at Philippi. He was put in prison and by the feet fast set in stocks. In other, in other words, he, he was, his feet were shut in by lock and key. He was stoned in Lystra, <clears throat> but he wasn't put to death, but, but bruised up and bleeding, I'm sure. In Iconia and Thessalonica, he was pursued by wicked people. So he was chased down and had to escape. In Ephesus, he was delivered to wild beasts, but they didn't eat him. In Damascus, he was let down by a, a rope in a basket along the wall. In Jerusalem, he was arrested, beaten, chained, and awaited to be slain. In Caesarea, he was enclosed and defamed. Sailing towards Italy, he was in the peril of death and shipwrecked. And from thence he came to Rome and was judged under Nero, and there finished his life. And how did he finish his life? It was at uh, Tre Fontaine, in, just outside of Rome. And you can still go there today. There's still the miraculous spring flowing there. And he lowered his head, St. Paul, and he said the prayer that St. Stephen prayed and that our Lord prayed on the cross. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. And he lowered his head and one blow, his head was struck off. And according to the miracles described the, his, his body gave off, gave off a sweet fragrance. The blood poured out like, like a white milk. And his head bounced three times where three fountains sprung up. And his head, of course, as I just said, is with St. Peter in St. John Lateran, above, way above the main altar. So these two great saints, St. Peter and Paul, um, there's no way we could sufficiently praise them, but they are certainly models of perseverance to the end. And under Nero, he was martyred uh, after St. Peter, who was crucified upside down. St. Paul has 13 epistles in the New Testament, and these epistles are full of the faith, because he saw revelations that God showed him and he writes them so everything St. Paul writes is inspired by God is inerrant with no error and infallible and the modernists of course they love to attack St. Paul for example when he speaks about how women's head are to be veiled and let women be subject to their husbands the feminists and the modernists say well St. Paul was a male chauvinist influenced by his time when the masculine uh, men, men's role in society was predominant and all this nonsense done by the modernists but it's for reasons of the faith that St. Paul says these things so everywhere his epistles are, are instruction are full of instruction full of example full of the praise and glory of God. And in one of his epistles, in the Colossians, he just breaks out to the glory and praise of the Most Blessed Trinity. So the great St. Paul, we can imitate his, his perseverance through so much suffering, through so many persecutions. And if you read his epistles, everywhere he went, he always had headaches. And the headaches happened to be the Jews. Everywhere he went, the Jews would raise up all kinds of trouble against him. 
sometimes openly, sometimes sneakily, but he always had to deal with them. So St. Paul is a proof to us, as he himself said, whoever will live piously in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. Will suffer persecution. And in and, and this gospel our Lord mentions, he mentions you will be put out of the synagogues and you will be flogged, whipped. So it's one thing to be whipped physically, in some ways that would be much easier. But to be whipped by the tongues, to be whipped by false accusations, to be whipped by the tongues of unjust men. And just look at the example of Archbishop Lefebvre, the media that whipped him, <laughs> that whipped him to no end for being disobedient, rebellious, schismatic, and then whipped by the tongues of, of his own Holy Father, the Pope, Pope uh, Paul VI, who gave him the suspension, which was totally null and void. And then Pope John Paul II, who gave him the so-called excommunication, which was a terrible persecution to undergo for a bishop loyal to the Catholic faith and loyal to Catholic tradition. So these kind of persecutions, in some way, they're worse because he loses his reputation and he's cast out. And this is what many of you and many of our faithful are asked to endure today for his sake. For the, for the de defense of the Catholic faith, we have to oppose Bishop Fillet's true liberalism and modernism. And for doing that, you're cast out. And even rejected by family members, and be rejected by old <coughs> friends, rejected by parishioners that you once were friends with, and by your own parish. These are heavy crosses. But they, they're nothing compared to the glory to come. And St. Paul is the one who says that all the sufferings of this time are nothing compared to the glory to come. So if we think we suffer much, and we priests especially, if we think we travel much, well, we can always go back to read St. Paul. Because his traveling was much more harsh than an air-conditioned airplane, than a car, the rental car that runs really smooth. And St. Paul never had this. He had the rough high seas to get seasick on, he was shipwrecked, he had to swim to shore with all his men, all of them survived, he prayed for them all, to the island of Malta. And on Malta, the, the natives came around to help them pull out the pieces of the ship and rescue who they could. And that night they were all shivering, the winds were blowing, and they got a fire going. And a huge pile of wood, and St. Paul was helping to, to build the fire for, for the other sailors who were who were shipwrecked, and some of them were Roman soldiers as well, because he was on the way to Rome to be tried in a Roman court. And it's in Rome he will die for the faith. So uh, what happened? One of these great miracles of St. Paul, he reached into the pile of wood to get more wood for the fire, and a poisonous snake came out of the pile and bit him in the arm. And the natives, they know these snakes. I don't know what, what kind it was, maybe a rattler. And they knew once you're bit by one of these, you've got half an hour to live. And St. Paul, he, he just went on loading up wood on the fire, taking care of the other men. And the natives were watching him, waiting for him to drop in a cold sweat and pass out and die. But he was miraculously, as our Lord said, you'll be bitten by serpents, they will do no harm on you. And they, when they saw St. Paul after two hours was fine, they said, this, this is not a man, this is a God. And they wanted to start going on their knees and bringing fruits and vegetables and meats to offer to St. Paul as, as a God. And St. Paul says, stop, stop, this is nonsense, I'm not a god, but if I was preserved by being killed, I'll preach to you, why? And who preserved me? 
And then to all the, the sailors, even to the Roman soldiers, and to all the natives, he preached our Lord Jesus Christ, the holy Catholic faith, that there's only one way to go to heaven. All the false gods of the Gentiles are devils. There's only one truth, only one baptism, only one faith, and only one way to heaven. And he was fearless to preach this. And when he went to Rome, he preached the same thing. And to preach, there's only one truth and only one God in Rome, by a Roman citizen, which St. Paul was, was considered the most unpatriotic, the most rebellious, the most unbelievable expressions that could come out of a mouth. And he died to prove it and seal it. And so did St. Peter. And the fact remains, because we're, our days are very similar, because Rome had many gods, they would incorporate other gods from other countries. And in the Pantheon, that was the big circular building for all gods. So our modern, modern Rome is very similar. Modern Rome has fallen into the same heresies called ecumenism. All religions put on a more or less equal level. And the heresies in Vatican II, especially the heresy of Lumen Gentium, that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. This is a heretical statement. It's open to all kinds of evil interpretations. And that is not the expression of the Catholic Church in her tradition. The expression is, the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the true Church of Jesus Christ. It's the same. But to say the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church is open to say, well, it also partly subsists in the Protestant Church, in the Lutheran Church, in the, the, the Anglicans, and all those, these false religions. So that Vatican II even praises the Muslims as having the same God as us. And that's blasphemy and that's heresy. Because the Muslims refuse to adore and profess the Blessed Trinity. It's for them, it's Allah, and the Allah is Satan. It's Satan. And Muhammad, his prophet, is a, was a demon and took many to hell, and he's burning in hell, according to St. Peter Mavimenus, who was himself martyred by the Muslims. <clears throat> now, in a recent interview that just happened this week, I think yesterday, with Bishop Saleh, you need to be aware of this as well. Because in this interview, Bishop Filet, I'm not going to read the whole interview, but he says this, We have never said that the Council directly made heretical statements. And in this interview he has other, other wish-wash statements. Let me, let me read a couple of them to you. He's In a lot of his answers, it's the typical, typical Bishop Filet answers, wish-wash, and not clear, and pleasing both sides. And we got to remember the words of Scripture, I have hated the double-tongued, says God. I have hated the double-tongued. But in this interview, he mentions about the Vatican II. Let me find the exact quote. Yes. We, um, many thoughts and aspects that we fought and combat, combated are now also confirmed by others. We never said that the Council directly made heretical statements, but the wall of protection against error has been removed, and in this way error has arisen. The faithful need protection. This is the constant struggle of the quarreling Church to defend the faith. But not all those who criticize the Council of the Media including the Emeritus Pope Benedict XVI, are making it a conflict at the point of bringing, of bringing, ex, uh, of, as a point of bringing to the excommunicated. He's asked, Excellent, Excellency, how did you celebrate your Episcopal consecration 30 years ago? Was that for you a definitive separation of the society from Rome, or an interim stage in conflict? where you had the reconciliation in mind. Bishop Follet, 
If it had been a separation from Rome, then I would not be here today. The Archbishop would not have consecrated me for that, and I would have rejected it. It was not a question of a separation from the Church, but of a demarcation from the modern spirit, from the fruits of the Council. So notice he doesn't say, um, it was not a question of separation from the Council. He never condemns the Council anymore. And that's, that's the liberal mind. He says the fruits of the Council are bad, that's true. And he says the, the Council of the Media, that was what the, the press spreads throughout the world about Vatican II, that's bad. But he never mentions the Council itself. With, and he never, he, as, as I just read out, and I'll read it again here, Meanwhile, others confess that something went wrong there. Yes. Well, of course, Archbishop Lefebvre pointed out the heresies of Vatican II. Many thoughts and aspects that we fought and combated are now also confirmed by others. We never said that the Council directly made heretical statements. Well, I don't know who he was consecrated. I know he was consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre, but you would never know it. You would never know it. And this is the error of Bishop Zendeos, that the, when he says that the errors of Vatican II were the misinterpretations afterwards, or it was just ambiguous, and it was just misinterpretations afterwards. So this is false. And Bishop Fillet does know better. He does know better. He knows Archbishop Lefebvre's words. He knows his writings. He's got this gem of a book, Spiritual Journey. Did Archbishop Lefebvre, did he hesitate to say Vatican II was full of errors? He says in the Declaration of 1974 that the Vatican II is, is full of errors and heresies. It's penetrated through and through. So that he, there might be some sentences that are good, there might be some phrases that are okay, but the, 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 the heresies and the errors permeate through even the good. Just like a drop of poison permeates through the glass of wine. You cannot take a sip of the wine and say, well, I'm just going to drink the good parts of the wine and leave out the poison. That's not how it works. Archbishop Lefebvre said, This Second Vatican Council reform, since it has issued from liberalism and from modernism, is entirely corrupt. Bishop Fillet doesn't say this anymore. It comes from heresy and results in heresy. Bishop Fillet doesn't say this anymore. No wonder Rome's about to give him the personal prelature. Because he's saying exactly what he needs to say to get it. Which is to stop pointing to Vatican II as the source of the heresies and errors. If he can get away slipperily in a slippery way by saying we condemn the fruits of the council, or the media version of the council, that's no, that's no headache for modernist Rome. No, no problem at all. But to say the heresies are built right in the way the Archbishop did, they're not going to accept that. And, they, and the Archbishop Lefebvre says also, even if all the acts of Vatican II are not formally heretical, it, it is still comes from heresy and results in heresy. It is thus impossible for any faithful Catholic who is aware of these things to adopt this reform or to submit to it in any way at all. To ensure our salvation, the only attitude of fidelity to the Church and to Catholic doctrine is a categorical refusal to accept the reform. This is gone now in the, in this, in the now conciliar society of Pius X. That's gone. They no longer condemn Vatican II. And if you don't condemn Vatican II, and if you don't categorically fight against it, then you are cooperating in the destruction of the Catholic Church, says Archbishop Lefebvre. And he says it numerous times. If we don't oppose this council, then we assist its, the destruction of our Lord's Catholic Church. And this is why we have to continue in the line of the Catholic resistance, on the shoulders of Archbishop Lefebvre. And it's a tough battle, isn't it? It's, we're six years now, 
six years after 2012's new direction, new profession of faith, Bishop Fillet says in this same interview, what's the solution to this problem? He says in one sentence, the personal prelature. The personal prelature means that he will be uh, probably made a cardinal and put over all the traditional groups. He will be the bishop of all, all for tradition. And that's the solution that Rome proposes. Would Archbishop Lefebvre accept that solution? No way. Because how often he said, as long as Rome persists in this evil council, in the reforms of the new mass, we cannot work together. We cannot cooperate in the destruction of the church. So again and again and again, we got to be reminded, and let me remind you again, by his own words, Archbishop Lefebvre, in a book that all the he wrote this book for his priests. Where are the priests to stand up and defend the line of Catholic tradition, the Catholic popes, the, the great council, the councils of the church, down to Vatican I, excluding Vatican II, and our own founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, where are the priests to stand up and defend this? And they all have a copy of this, this gem of a book, Spiritual Journey. He wrote it for his priests especially. And you would think, being called Spiritual Journey, it's all like the new SSPX sermons and articles of the Angelus magazine. All about fluff and beautiful churches and nice lives of saints and virtues and harmless, fluffy stuff, but never attacking Vatican II and the New Mass. But the moment you open this book, and on any page, <laughs> he, he blasts Vatican II and the New Mass, almost on every page. So he understands you cannot have a spiritual journey to sanctity, to heaven. We cannot become saints without fighting the battle that's on us right now. And that's the modernism destroying the Catholic Church. And we got to pray for Bishop Fillet. He's, he's in serious danger of losing the faith and losing his soul. Pray for him. And he's leading all these good priests and the three other bishops in the same danger. And all these many, many families, he's leading them to danger. And it's, he's already signed on it. He's already given in. He's ready for the personal prelature. And he says at the end of this interview in Germany, he says at the end of it, we're on good terms with Pope Francis. And he's do he does us many favors. <laughs> so, <laughs> very sad. Very, very sad. Because, yeah, Pope Francis gets along well with everybody. He's shaking hands with the perverts, the LGBTQ garbage. He's shaking hands with communists, socialists, Freemasons. And, well, hey, well, Bishop Fillet is shaking hands and, and having good times with him, too, because Bishop Fillet has agreed to be silent. And once you cave into silence, you betray our Lord, you betray the Catholic faith. And all the priests of the society, they... They are sinning by remaining silent. We are ordained as priests. One of our duties, the first duty is to offer Mass. Second duty, be men of prayer. Third, preach the faith. And preaching the faith means you got to say the truth. And if the world doesn't like it and they stone you like St. Paul and drive you out and exile you, all right, we move on. St. Catherine of Siena shouted in her, her day, souls are falling into hell because of silence. Silence of bishops, silence of priests. And just think today how many poor souls are, are on the road to hell because they just don't hear the truth spoken anymore. And in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and throughout some of the churches of Ireland, and not just Kentucky, all over the United States, they're welcoming the, the pardon me for even bringing this up because it's just so gross and sick, but they, they're welcoming with open arms the U.S. bishops and in Ireland and all over the world, the LGBTQ community, they're called, when they should be excommunicated by these bishops 
And if they really love their souls, they're going to tell them, look, the way you're living, you're going to go straight to hell. And it's not some chromosome change that you're born with. And it's not some uh, natural thing that you're supposed to be born with. It's not. It's a disorder of original sin. And it's a grave sin against God. And God punishes it severely. Sodom and Gomorrah is there for everybody to see. You can take a flight, take a car to the south side of the Dead Sea, and drive right in the middle of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can see videos of it if you want. And you've got light, you know, golf ball size sulfur and brimstone balls. The city was cooked, baked, and everyone in it, that's five cities actually, was cooked. There was no survivors except for Lot and his family. His wife almost made it, but curiosity killed that cat. And <laughs> Lot's wife, they actually believe they have found the pillar of, the, of salt. She was changed into a pillar of salt. God told her, don't, don't, he told them all, don't look. I don't want you to see my justice. But she got curious, turned around, and she was made a pillar of salt. And there is a strange pillar of salt standing there outside the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is believed to be Lot's wife. So she still stands there. So, but the bishops, they're silent. The Pope, silent. The priests now, the Society of Pius X, who are supposed to be the watchdogs, and just echo, they don't have to make anything new, we just quote our founder. Quote our founder. And this is why in 2012, preaching the sermon for the First Mass of Father Stephen Reuter, who also a young priest, pray for him. I know him, he's a good boy, good young man, but he should know better than going along with this. But at that sermon, all I read was Archbishop Lefebvre extensively. And it was actually, it was just a regular, boring, long, old, typical Society of Pius X sermon. Nothing, nothing new, nothing spectacular, just rather boring. If other priests would have done a better job reading it and preaching that sermon. But it was my honor to preach for Father Ruder, and I gave the sermon, and it was right after that sermon, Father Rostan, District Superior, hunted me down in the sacristy, said, Father Hugo, report to my office now. So I said, okay. So I went, and he said, uh, that sermon, if it goes on internet, I'm going to have you sent to New Zealand. And uh, then Bishop Fillet, I, when I got back to Syracuse, I called him, and, and uh, he rebuked me for preaching the sermon, mentioning the agreement with Rome, and he said, at an at a, at a ordination ceremony, you don't preach about these things. You should preach about the fluffy, nice stuff. So I said, all I did was quote Archbishop Lefebvre. That's all I did. Listen to the sermon. It's even written. You can read it. So for that sermon, that sermon quoting our founder, I was silenced. And that summer I had three weddings, uh, and two of them were my relatives. So I couldn't just drop those weddings, I, but I, I was forbidden to preach at those weddings. I was silenced by Bishop Fillet. <laughs> so, um, but for what? For what? just repeating Archbishop of Feb, and I'm going to repeat him again. And they can excommunicate me, they can silence me all they want. I'm not going to stop pre preaching what our founder preached, which still applies more than ever right now. We are at war to save our souls. We are at war to preserve the true Catholic faith of all time. We're in war. And the biggest thing the enemy wants is us to lay down our weapons. You lay down the weapons, this is why the U.S., that's why we got all these uh, false red flags. Boston was one of them, the Boston Marathon. A false flag. <clears throat> and there's a lot of them. 9-11 was another one. And there's more and more evidence coming out. Why these false flags? Because they want the United States unarmed. They want the citizens of the United States unarmed. And when you got a population with no weapons, to self-defend their families, their cities, their, 
their homeland, their lands, their easy takeover. This is history. This is just common sense. Get a hockey team with no sticks. That's an easy win. You day to lay down your weapons. You're finished. And that's what the, the, the One World Order is trying to destroy our country. And they're doing a good job. Morally, it's already destroyed. All our, how many millions abortions and divorces and euthanasia. Now, they, now the gay right, pardon me, I shouldn't say that word. The, um, the, the horrible sodomite rights, LGBTQ, pardon me, but it's, it's, it's our sick world. And now they've been really working to un disarm our people. And once we're disarmed, we're, we're finished. We're easy fodder, easy takeover. And it will be a fitting punishment because we've, we've turned our back on God as a nation. And the bishops have gone silent like little mice. Even mice squeak. But even not, these bishops don't even squeak. They're just ashamed. I pray for them. They'll have a lot to answer. And our poor Pope, what a mess. What a mess. When, when our leaders are effeminate, it's a punishment from God, says the scripture. Isaiah says that. God punishes a people by giving them effeminate rulers to govern over them. And that's exactly what we got, both in the state and in the church. So, listen to some sanity. Archbishop Lefebvre. He says this in the opening letter of Spiritual Journey. Is it all fluff? Listen to this. The liberals were able to choose popes like John the Twenty-Third and Paul the Sixth, causing their doctrine to triumph in the Council, Vatican II. A marvelous means to obligate or oblige all of the Church to adopt their errors. Having assisted at the dramatic contest between Cardinal Bea, representing liberalism, and Cardinal Ottaviani, representing the doctrine of the Church, it was clear after the vote of the 70 cardinals that the rupture was consummated. So the split between Catholic Church and Conciliar Church. And that split's still there. Bishop Follet sees it all as one, and he's wrong. One could think without fooling oneself that the support of the Pope would go to the liberals. But henceforth this problem was in broad daylight. What would the bishops do, aware of the danger which threatened the church? All could see the triumph within the church of new ideas, born of the revolution and the Freemasonic lodges. 250 cardinals and bishops rejoiced at their victory. 250 were horror-stricken. These were the 250 traditional bishops. 1,750 bishops tried not to ask questions but simply followed the Pope. They said, we shall see to it later. Exactly what's happening now in the Society of St. Pius X. They're silent, we'll just see. Well, we'll wait till the general chapter coming up in July. And maybe there'll be a new general superior and he'll bring everything back to tradition in the Society of St. Pius X. It's not going to happen. Bishop Follet has had 12 years and plus to clean out all the traditional priests and put in the liberals, and that's exactly what's happened. <clears throat> the council proceeds, and the reforms multiply as quickly as possible. The persecution of traditional cardinals and bishops begins, and soon after, the persecution of priests and religious everywhere who attempt to preserve tradition. It is an open war against the church's past and her institutions. Aggiornamento, aggiornamento, he quotes. Updating, we got to update. <clears throat> the result of this council, Vatican II, is much worse than that of the French Revolution. The French Revolution had executions and the martyrdoms of... Uh, the martyrdoms, excuse me. The, 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 at the French Revolution, there were executions and martyrdoms. Now the executions and martyrdoms are silent. Tens of thousands of priests and religious abandon their vows. Others leave the religious life. Cloisters disappear. Vandalism invades the churches. Altars are destroyed. Crosses disappear. The seminaries and novitiates are emptied. The civil societies that are still Catholic become secular under pressure from Rome authorities. 
our Lord should no longer reign here below. And then I fast forward a little bit here. Here he says something very strong, and we could add in the name of Pope Francis. He says, It is obvious that if many bishops had acted like Monsignor de Castro Mayer, Bishop of Campos in Brazil, the ide ideological revolution within the church could have been limited. Because we must not be afraid to affirm that the current Roman authorities, since John the 23rd and Paul the 6th, have made themselves active collaborators of international Jewish Freemasonry and of world socialism. John Paul II and Pope Francis also, and Benedict XVI also, is above all a communist loving politician at the service of a world communism retaining a hint or little taste of religion. He openly attacks all of the anti-communist governments and does not bring by his travels any Catholic revival. Now these World Youth Days that John Paul II started, these World, World Youth Days are a scandal. I'm not going to go into details here, but they are a scandal. <coughs> all these young people without their parents, figure it out. No parents, no supervision, no. It's Woodstock. It's, it's, it's that horrible hippie Woodstock that was held in the 60s in New York. Horrible thing that the liberals all love and praise. These conciliar Roman authorities cannot but oppose savagely and violently any reaffirmation of the traditional magisterium. We're at war. Bishop Fillet has signed on it. And he's given in to these liberals and modernists and destroyers of the church. He's playing into their game. Poor Bishop Follet and the other bishops and all the priests. The errors of the council and its reforms remain the official standard consecrated by the profession of faith of Cardinal Ratzinger in March of 1989. Archbishop Lefebvre condemned this profession of faith. In the doctrinal declaration, Bishop Follet accepts it. Go ahead and find it yourself. He signed on it. And then Bishop, well, Bishop Lefebvre says, I fast forward here a little bit, I could, I could rightly think that this society of St. Pius X, which wanted to be attached to all the traditions of the church, doctrinal, disciplinary, disciplinary liturgical, etc., would not remain for very long approved by the liberal destroyer, destroyers of the church. Not only will they not approve it, since they couldn't crush it, they could infiltrate it. And they did. And this, these words I'm going to read apply <coughs> again right now. But the mystery is that there were not 50 or even 100 bishops to act as Bishop de Castro Mayer and myself did, as true successors of the apostles against impostors. And in 2012, the same thing. How many priests to fight in the resistance? How many priests to defend the Society of Pius X of Archbishop of Fed? Hardly a handful. It is not pride and self-importance to say that God in his merciful wisdom saved the heritage of his priesthood, of his grace, of his revelation <coughs> through these two bishops. It is not we who chose ourselves, but God has guided us in the upholding of all the riches of his, of his incarnation and of his redemption. Those who feel they must minimize these riches and deny them can only condemn us. This can only confirm their schism with our Lord and his kingdom by means of their secularism and their apostate ecumenism. I can hear them say, oh, you exaggerate. There are many good bishops who pray, who have the faith, who are edifying. Same thing now. What are you saying that the society has gone down? There's many good priests who still condemn Vatican II. So Bishop Tissier still can mentions Vatican II. So how can you say it's all bad? So this is what Archbishop Lefebvre is saying in his day. Were they, were they saints as soon as they accept false religious liberty? Hence the secular state, false ecumenism, 
and hence the admission of many ways of salvation, of liturgical reform, and hence of the practical negation of the sacrifice of the Mass, of the new catechisms, with all their errors and heresies, they officially contribute to the revolution within the Church and to its destruction. All those good bishops, they officially uh, lend it to the destruction of the Church. And all those good society priests and bishops who are going along with Bishop Fillet without barking against his, uh, his, his erroneous direction, they're contributing to the destruction of the Catholic Church and the destruction of the real work of Archbishop Lefebvre, which is nothing but the work of the Church. And now listen to this, and this applies more than ever. And he wrote this in 1990. It's more applicable than then. The current Pope and bishops are no longer, they no longer hand down our Lord Jesus Christ, but rather a sentimental, superficial, charismatic religiosity through which, as a general rule, the true grace of the Holy Ghost no longer passes. This new religion is not the Catholic religion. It is sterile, incapable of sanctifying society and the family. This is why the new Mass does not give grace. He says it himself. They have shut down the fountains of grace. Bishop Fillet, did you forget this? Why did you forget this? One single thing, he says, is necessary for the continuation of the Catholic Church. Fully Catholic bishops. Where are they now? Where are they? Who make no compromise with error. Where are they? Who f bishops who found Catholic seminaries. Where are they? <laughs> Bishops, where young candidates for the priesthood, seminaries, where young candidates for the priesthood can nourish themselves with the milk of the true doctrine, placing our Lord Jesus Christ at the center of their intellects, of their wills and their hearts. Where are they? Let me fast forward a little more here, and we're almost done. The evil of the council, Vatican II, is the ignorance of Jesus Christ and of his kingdom. It is the evil of the bad angels, the evil which is the way to hell. Archbishop Lefebvre, is there any confusion here? Anybody? Anyone confused about Bishop Lefebvre's position? <laughs> and is there confusion about Bishop Fillet's con uh, position? Yes. Nobody knows really where he stands, but he's making it more and more clear. And he made it very clear in 2012. He's with the new religion and the new church, which, by the way, is, is of the evil of the council, is the ignorance of Jesus Christ and his kingdom, it is the evil of the bad angels, the evil which is the way to hell. This is where Bishop Fillet has chosen to go and pray for him. It's frightening. And no less the fake resistance. Bishop Williamson, he also knows better. He knows better than giving so much green light or even yellow light to the new mass and to the uh, wherever you can find a Latin mass and he knows better why are these bishops betraying our Lord the church and Archbishop Lefebvre like this so and then he reaffirms the importance of St. Thomas Aquinas in the seminaries the papal encyclicals prayer and contemplation. That's Archbishop Lefebvre. Not this wish-wash and not this double-speak. So dear faithful, persevere. These are glorious days in fact. They're hard days. You gotta drive for miles to come to Mass. And uh, alright, we, we got a long list, but nothing compared to St. Paul. <laughs> nothing. So persevere. And if it even does come to arrest and bloodshed, imprisonment, and executions, the more we should rejoice, the more we should be happy, because the glory given to God, and it's a, it's a great grace for any of us to be able to profess the Catholic faith. It's such a grace, but we've got to pray to persevere to the end. He who perseveres to the end, says our Lord, 
he will be saved. And St. Bernard says, the crown is not given to those who begin well. The crown is not given even to those who advance far. The crown is only given to those who persevere to the end. And we're not going to do it without Our Lady, the daily rosary, the scapular, and, and being truly humble of heart, begging God the graces to persevere. Which grace I ask for you all in this Holy Mass, so that like St. Paul you could say when you're dying, I have fought the good fight of the faith. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.